Okay. Uh, okay. So uh, it's my uh, my pleasure to introduce Benedict Benedict Diemer today. So uh, Benedict uh, did his uh, PhD at the University of Chicago, uh, working with uh, Andrew Kratzow. Um, then he was a postdoc for a few years at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. Uh, that's that's where we met um, a few years ago. Um, and since August of this year, he's a professor at the University of Maryland. Uh, so Benedict works uh, on a variety of topics uh, in cosmology. Uh, I guess his, his PhD thesis uh, was on uh, halo profiles and uh, the splashback radius, which is a very cool concept that he will talk about in a second. And um, then in, uh, in his postdoc work, he uh, diversified a little bit and uh, uh, he uh, estimated like uh, the uh, cold, cold gas content in hydrodynamic simulations, uh, uh, star formation histories, uh, things like that. Um, uh, but now, now that he's a professor, he can return to, uh, the, to this, all of these uh, cosmology topics. Um, he also has a, a Python package for cosmology. It's called uh, Colossus. So uh, if you ever need to do like a, some um, integral with halo profiles or something like that, you should probably you should probably check uh, Colossus first. Uh, on, unless you're a student uh, work, uh, taking cosmology, then it will be cheating to, to use uh, Colossus, right? But, um, so uh, yeah, I, I think uh, that's it. So Benedict, uh, can you share uh, your screen? Or? Do I have to make you co-host? Okay, great. Thank you so much, Vicente. Um, I particularly love people who introduce me by plugging Colossus. That's just perfect, you know, so I don't have to do it. <laughs> uh, I should say that if you're a student, then Colossus is particularly made for you. Uh, hmm. it's, it's made for cheating, basically. It's supposed <laughs> to be as easy as possible. Uh, and to basically smash your cosmology class. Anyway, so as we said, um, uh, it's a real pleasure to, uh, to well, not be here. I really wish I could have visited in person, um, but such is life. Uh, and hopefully one day I'll make it down to Mexico to see you all uh, in real life. Anyway, in the meantime, as we sent the advertised, I'm gonna talk about dark matter. Uh, and this is work, in fact, that I've been doing since my PhD with Andre, um, and then with the sort of growing cast of characters that are listed on this slide, um, but that's not even all of them, so I, I, I will try to point out some people as I go along. Um, so when we talk about structure formation, what structure do we mean? We mean the galaxies in the universe that are not arranged randomly. They come in this pattern that looks like a spider web that we call the cosmic web. And the question we're fundamentally asking is, does our theory of the universe, cosmology, predict this, explain this? And if so, what can we learn about the things that we cannot see, like the dark matter halos, for example? And we all know this problem is, is incredibly complicated, completely intractable algebraically, and so you need computer simulations. But at least the universe is giving us very good initial conditions in the form of the cosmic microwave background, which tells us how strong the fluctuations were in the beginning of the universe. And so what we can do is we can imagine our universe like a cube of dark matter particles, say like a billion, and then we can perturb their initial positions so that they make ripples that look like the ones in the CMB, and then we let gravity do its thing in our simulation. So the first thing you might notice about this video is that the box is repeating. There is a repeating pattern here, and that's because we're simulating an infinitely repeating universe um, that uh, sort of goes to infinity just by repetition. Uh, in the beginning, you saw the Hubble flow whipping the universe apart, the expansion, but then slowly gravity wins over, at least in small regions, and pulls the dark matter into this cosmic web of voids, walls, filaments, and halos. And so what we care about the most when we look into our cosmic web in the end is, of course, those halos, and that's because they host all of the, almost all of the visible matter, be it in, in wolf galaxies or in Milky Ways or in galaxy clusters. And so today, um, what we want to talk about is um, why have I drawn these red circles where I did? Uh, I could have drawn them somewhere else, maybe. Uh, there are also many other things we could be talking about. How are those halos arranged? You know, where are they positionally and so on? 
Um, but I want to focus about sort of the outskirts of these halos because in this image, you should imagine that these baryons, the visible things are at the very centers of those halos. Um, they're like maybe one, two percent the size of the halos. And for much of this talk today, we are actually okay in ignoring the baryons. Um, they're just sort of far away at the center, but we will of course come back to them. And then what I want to do is I want to talk about how these halos are really influenced by their history. And that matters because they set the gravitational potential for the galaxies. And at least as importantly, they also set the history of how these galaxies form, when they form, and so on. Uh, I forgot to say in the beginning, by the way, if you have questions during the talk, feel free to put them into the chat. I'm trying to monitor the chat window. I can't promise I'll always see them, but I will do my best. So what do you need to know about these uh, profiles of these halos or like their structure? Basically, um, the way we normally quantify this is called a density profile. So logarithmic density versus logarithmic radius. And um, it, the main thing you have to know is that these profiles steepen. They're shallow at the center, they get steeper towards the outskirts. There's a particular radius where the logarithmic slope is minus two, that's called the scale radius. And that's relatively far inside the halo, not as small as the galaxy maybe, but it's not, it's sort of far in the halo. And so what we also want to do is we want to quantify the whole size or mass of a halo. And so for that, we have to do something else. And for that, we use what's called a spherical over density radius, something like R200 critical. So here we go to the center of the halo and we measure the enclosed average density within a certain radius and we keep going out until we reach some number, say 200 times the critical density of the universe or 200 times the mean density or something like that. And because of that definition, the mass is, is very simple to compute. It is just that density times the volume of the sphere that we have drawn. And that's how people typically think about halos, think about sort of where they end. The most important fitting function for these profiles is of course the navarro frank white profile where we're assuming that the halo is a power law at small and the large radii with slopes of minus one and minus three. But that should immediately give us pause because if that is true, then we're saying there really is no edge to the halo, right? The power law would just continue forever. There is no preferred scale. And we would have to ask, why are we drawing our halo radius where we're drawing it? What's the point? Um, now, when you look at the actual density field, it may not be so apparent that these radii make any sense. And there are actually many different ones. So for example, people who study galaxy clusters tend to use R500 critical. So 500 critical, that's a very large density. So you have to go far into the halo to a small radius to, to achieve it on average. And then some people use 200 critical. Some people like the virial radius, as it's called. That's a varying over density. And then the biggest one that people use is 200 mean, so that's 200 times the, the matter density of the universe. Uh, and because that's the lowest density, that's going to the largest radii where the halos are getting less dense. So we can see that this makes a big difference, but you know, most people don't really care about this density field that I'm showing you. They just care about getting a nice compact description of their dark matter density field as halos, sizes, masses, and positions, basically. And then on this, we're basing so many things. What we call the halo mass function. What we, like when we do the galaxy halo connection in, in which halos we place galaxies. What we call a subhalo, right? So a subhalo is a, a halo that is inside another larger halo. And clearly that will change dramatically if we are changing these radii. So to me, it's very obvious that this is a really important question, how we define these halo sizes and masses. But this question hasn't really gotten all that much attention over the last sort of 10, 20 years. Um, and so today I wanna sort of break with some of that conventional wisdom and see if we can do something new, something better. Now you might say, why should I care? You know, it seems like everybody's happy, right? So these definitions work very well. In fact, they are good in the sense that they're very easy to compute, right? Um, but there are some issues with these conventional halo definitions. And I'm not going to go into the many issues there are, but I'll just give you one example, which is this uh, whole literature about what's called ejected satellites. So these are satellites that are orbiting outside of the very radius of their halo. And they look like satellites. They're preferentially quenched, so they're redder uh, and all that good stuff. And so there are many, many papers about 
why this might be, and so on. And I would just argue that this is simply because you've drawn the halo radius wrong, right? If you have too small a radius for your host halo, well, then of course some of the satellites are going to orbit outside of that radius. Um, and so this is just one example of what I would argue is a bigger trend that these definitions that we have do not really count the whole halo. But then we might have to ask, so, you know, if, uh, if we don't like the current definitions for various reasons, then what is it? What else can we do, right? And so for that, we turn back to the theoretical models from the 1980s. So then people like to do the shell modeling, um, secondary collapse model. Imagine there is a, you live in a universe that is only dark matter, comes in shells around a point, and there's a point perturbation at the center that I'm not showing. Then basically everything is gonna expand with the Hubble flow, but inside of what's called the turnaround radius, the gravity is gonna pull these shells in. Uh, more and more dark matter shells are going to fall in. They're collisionless, so they're gonna orbit right through the center. They're gonna go right through each other. And then they start going back and forth in the halo. And as this movie of this model progresses, you see that uh, the halo grows, of course. The turnaround radius also grows. But there's this characteristic radius where shells pile up. And that is at the upper center of their first radius. So they fall in, they go through the halo once, and then they get very slow, and then they slowly fall back. And so they spend quite a lot of time out there and make what's called a caustic, so an infinite density drop in this model. And this is what we're going to call the splashback radius. Splashback because they've fallen, they're sort of splashed back to the other side. And I will argue that it's an excellent definition of the halo boundary because it's, it separates stuff that is falling in for the first time from stuff that's orbiting back and forth in the halo, which is kind of exactly the definition you want. And then of course, this would by construction also include all of your satellites because they're also just like particles basically. But you would probably say, well, this is very unrealistic. No, I mean, we know that real halos do not look like this at all and you'd be correct. If we look at the formation of a halo in one of my simulations, it doesn't look anything like this, right? So the universe uh, has a different cosmology that's more complicated. Uh, the halos do not form in isolation. Little things form first and then make big things and this leads to these very messy mergers. Um, and also halos do not form from point perturbations. They form from this initial Gaussian random field that we saw in the very beginning. Nevertheless, as this movie goes on, you can start to see splashback. If you look at this biggest halo, you see stuff falling in coming out to the other side and it makes this kind of yellow glow around the halo, uh, which basically contains a lot of the satellites also. You can see that there are a lot of satellites that come out to that radius. And so I'm arguing that this is the radius we should be using. The wide radii are the, the conventional virial radii. And so you see that there's a lot of that halo that is not included that I argue should be included. But now you might say, well, this is a bit weird. So we said the halos are NFW profiles and so there should be power law. Now I'm telling you, we can see this splashback, this infinitely sharp drop in a Lambda CDM simulation. So something is not right. And what's not right is indeed the profiles. So let's look at this briefly. Uh, here are some more density profiles. These are now from simulations. So again, density versus radius. And on top, we have very small galaxy halos. At the bottom, we have very massive cluster halos. And just by eye, you can see they are different, but it's easier to see when you look at their slope. So D log rho over D log r. So it's focused on the top panel first. There you see that these halos, they basically follow this NFW profile, which is this dot dashed line. So they go slowly from a slope of minus one to minus three until about the virial radius. And then they get much shallower. And that's because you're hitting these infalling shells. And they are not modeled by this profile. So that's okay that it doesn't match beyond say the very radius. But for the massive halos, the profile looks quite different. There you go to much steeper slopes like minus four, which isn't really expected anywhere. And then again, you hit the infalling shells. So is it possible that we're seeing here this caustic due to the splashback radius? And the answer is indeed, yes. But I think it was really fun that, um, it's really weird that it took until 2014 to see that in simulations when this was all proposed in the 1980s. Um, so let's look at how this works out in some individual halos. So here is a, a density slice through a simulated halo. Um, and you have the R200 critical, R200 mean, these conventional radii, and then the splashback radius in dashed lines right where you put it by eye, basically, where the density drops sharply. 
But it turns out that it's not always quite like this, that the splashback radius is bigger than these conventional radii. It can also be even smaller. And so the difference, it turns out, between these two halos is that the one on the right is growing very quickly, whereas the one on the left is growing slowly. And this is actually not too hard to understand. So imagine you're a particle, you're falling in, and you have a certain kinetic energy. You're going to come out the other side to a certain radius, a splashback radius. But if the halo now gains a ton of mass while you're on this orbit, and these orbits are long, these are giga year long orbits, then the gravity well deepens, you're going to get pulled back more strongly, and you're going to have a smaller apocenter or a smaller splashback radius. And so the reason we saw this more strongly in the bigger halos is because they're accreting more quickly today, so clusters are still growing, whereas, uh, say, Milky Way halos are typically not growing anymore. And also because the bigger halos, they dominate their environment more, so you can just see it more easily. So that's the very fundamental idea of the splashback radius and its relation to these conventional radii. Um, but, you know, you might say, this is all very cool, but can we observe any of this? So my first caution would be, we, we can't actually observe, a priori, we can't observe any of these radii, right? So even these conventional virial radii are not typically observed or inferred from some other things. But let's see if we can actually observe the splashback radius. So here is the challenge. Um, we might want to go to galaxy clusters because we saw it's sort of most clean, the, the drop in the density profile is cleanest in these most massive halos, cluster halos. Um, and also we have most observational kind of uh, probes in clusters. But the challenge is that when you think of a cluster, you might think of an image like this one. Um, but unfortunately, the splashback radius is, is huge compared to how people normally think about clusters. Right? When we think about the cluster, we think about the X-ray gas and the galaxies. And a lot of that is really centrally concentrated, whereas we're now talking about mega parsecs. So it's observationally very challenging. And when we first proposed it, I actually thought this would never be observable. But the observers totally blew me out of the water. I had no idea. Um, and it only took basically two years for people to find it. And the way they found it is as follows. So you don't look at one cluster. You look at thousands. You just stack thousands of clusters from, say, SDES or DES, one of these galaxy surveys. And you just count all the galaxies around the clusters. And what you see is, so this is what I'm showing here. So you have the surface density profile of galaxies as a function of radius. The black line is for all galaxies. And you can already see that characteristic break sort of at a particular radius, about a megaparsec ish. But then they split it into red and blue galaxies. And then you see it really clearly. It's basically completely in the red galaxies. And the, the profile of the blue galaxies is kind of, you know, smooth. And this is shown in the bottom where you again have the slope. So this is this d log rho over d log r. And you see there's this sharp break, this uh, dip in the red galaxies that gets much steeper than you would expect from something like the NFW profile. So the assumption here is that the galaxies live in subhalos. And the subhalos basically follow the overall dark matter density field, right? So that you can use galaxies just to look at the density profile of dark matter halos. And this works surprisingly well, at least at these large radii. If you go to the center, it's not so good because galaxies get destroyed and so on. But out there, it's actually really pretty accurate. And so this is really the smoking gun signal for the splashback radius, because the red galaxies are the ones that have orbited one. So the splashback radius is defined by these things that are orbiting. And those are the galaxies that have been quenched, whereas these blue galaxies, they are probably on a first infall into the clusters. So this was incredibly cool. Uh, then a lot of new measurements actually followed in the last few years. Uh, so this is one of the most accurate ones from the Dark Energy Survey from Changeda. Uh, here is what they got again for the slope profile. So we can see the dip uh, in galaxies. And they also did weak lensing, which is nice because you don't have to rely on this assumption about subhalos. So again, you stack clusters and you look at the weak lensing signal. And again, you see the dip. And this is really incompatible with like sort of the NFW profile. Um, but it's sort of explained by this profile that we suggested back in 2014. And I should say that this is not a fit, right? This is a prediction. This is what we said the profile should be like for these halos of that mass. But now you might complain and say, well, OK, this looks sort of relatively neat. But it seems like the splashback radius is in the wrong place in the observations. And indeed, in the beginning, um, until about 2017, that seemed like a massive issue. And we were very confused about it. But it's actually been solved since. So here is my summary plot. Um, 
basically on the x-axis you have mass so peak height doesn't really matter it's sort of big or as to the right and on the y-axis you have where the splashback radius is with respect to the conventional r200 mean radius and so each of these points is an observation on a paper basically and the ones that were very low are these dark blue ones on the left and it turns out that they're all using a particular type of optical cluster selection which is quite biased and so this was a cool story of how that got figured out so the newest points like this orange one are actually um, in agreement with uh, theory which is neat and so there are new points there's actually already a new point that i've not had time to put on this plot yet so it's been very exciting to watch uh, the observers just absolutely go at this problem and we'll come back to some more observations later but uh, first of course this provided massive motivation to go back and do some more theory in particular um, what we've done so far is in everything I've shown you, we've sort of stacked profiles, right? We have shown you average profiles and simulations, and then we looked at these average profiles and observations. Um, Rosa is asking, do you need to scale the halos by some characteristic radius before stacking them? That's a fantastic question. Um, in fact, I've had arguments about this with many people. <laughs> so it turns out you don't have to, you can just use megaparsecs, but you're making a sort of suboptimal choice because then you can imagine you're actually stacking halos of different radii, different sizes. And so you're kind of washing out the features. It's better if you actually scale them by something like R200 mean, if you have some way to measure it. Um, and then you will basically line them up more accurately and you'll get a cleaner profile out in the end. So this question actually highlights very nicely why the stacking is sort of, I mean, it's very useful in observations, but it brings up all these other issues, right? Ideally, what you want to be able to do is you want to define a splashback radius also for every individual halo, like you do with these variable radii or whatever. And so the question then is how to do that, because it turns out that you just measuring the profile and looking for the steep drop doesn't always work. And that's because halos are very messy. You can have substructure and filaments, and it's just not really possible in all cases. And so um, the algorithm that uh, I started working on um, is called Sparta. It's actually more like a general code framework at this point, it stands for subhalo and particle trajectory analysis. And the idea is to really look at the dynamics of the individual particles. So we said what the splashback radius really is, is this radius where particles reach the upper center after their first orbit. And in simulations, we have all the information. We can look at all the particles. It's just a lot of work because there are billions of them. And so you need a really MPI parallelized C code. You know, this is not something you can do in Python anymore when you want to look at billions of particles. But this is what Sparta does. It's basically a general framework where you can write plugins so it can analyze a whole simulation going forward in time, all the different time slices, can look at all the particles, and then you can write a plugin and tell it what to do basically with this data. Probably easiest explained with a movie of how it works out the splashback radius. So uh, this is now one halo. Each point is a little dark matter particle falling into the halo in the simulation. And Sparta tracks all of these orbits and then figures out where this particle reaches its first upper center and makes a white dot, which then fades. And from these white dots, we can then um, construct the splashback radius, the solid line. It looks a bit funny now because you're seeing a slice through the halo, so there are many other points that you can't see. But basically, we're just taking a percentile. We're saying, I want the radius that includes like 80, 90, whatever percent of those white points of these orbits. And then there are many, many, many complications, like those purple points that show you subhalos, uh, which you have to throw out. And so it's a, basically, you know, way more complicated than I'm making it sound here. But um, I think the algorithm works really pretty well. Um, and so what you then get out of this whole thing is basically splashback radii for everything in your simulation. So here's a density field again from a simulation. In orange, we have the conventional radii and in white, we now have splashback radii, which we see are on average significantly larger than the previous radii. And that was sort of what we got in 2017. Now when you have that, you can do things like, you know, answer some basic questions like, where is the splashback radius? So in this usual units of splashback over R200 mean, for example, we see this trend that I talked about earlier, where when you plot mass accretion rate on the x-axis, so on the left, you have halos that are just sitting there, not much is happening, they're growing very slowly. Then you have a large splashback radius, the particles are going far out compared to these conventional radii. And then if you go to fast growing halos, 
this flashback radius moves inwards compared to the old radius. And you can do the same for mass, looks similar. Note now mass and radius are now independent, right? So there's no unique over density anymore between them. So in fact, you can work out what the over density would be. So what would be the equivalent over density radius? And you see that the over density depends strongly on mass accretion rate. So there is not, this does not correspond to one of those conventional radii. You really have to work it out for each individual halo. And these are data from Sparta, by the way. So we worked out all this flashback radii using Sparta. So this is very nice, but there was actually, it was actually kind of limited what we could do back then because what you now need to do is you need to work out what happens to all your subhalos. So we have all these changing radii, right? and that means that you will call different halo subhalos. And for this purpose, um, I realized that the only thing that would be useful would be to pr basically provide halo catalogs like the ones people are using, but now with splashback data in them for the community. And that's what I've been working on and that's what I put out this summer. Um, so I took 14 n-body simulations. Here are some different you know, box sizes um, and basically computed splashback radii for all of them and then computed how these different definitions uh, lead to different subhalos. These catalogs are online. You can just download them from my website and play with them. They are basically Rockstar catalogs. So if you're familiar with Peter Beruzzi's Rockstar Halo Finder, so that's what I ran. So I use that to find the halos. Then I add the data from Sparta about the splashback radius. And then I'm basically making combined catalogs for both Rockstar and Sparta that have all this different stuff in it. There's no need to read any of the slides in detail. These are just some fields that are in these catalogs. Those of you who work with halos might recognize some of this. The main point is that you have now not one radius definition like you normally do, you have like 20. And for each of these definitions, it also tells you which halo would be a subhalo of which other halo. So you can just very easily switch your definition and explore the way you're defining halos in your simulation. And this makes a big difference. So now in this picture, I'm marking subhalos in orange and, and host halos, so the ones that are not subhalos in white. Now, when we use something like R500 critical, a very small radius, barely any halos or subhalos. And then as I go up to R200 critical, there are some more, virial, some more, 200 mean, more. Now, if we use a splashback radius that includes 75% of all the orbits, you already have way more subhalos. And if we go to one that includes 90% of all the orbits, which is kind of the definition that we'll be using mostly from now on, um, it's really a completely changed picture of your universe. You can see that when you just put them next to each other, how drastically your idea changes of how big halos are, but also how many of them are actually subhalos of something bigger, which really matters for the physics that's going on. But we can also explore this in a little more detail. Um, so here I'm showing the, the subhalo fraction uh, now for the virial mass definition. So on the x-axis, you have mass. This is going again from small galaxies to very massive clusters. And I'm simply asking at that mass, what fraction of halos is a subhalo? And so you see it goes from zero. Of course, when you're the most massive halo in the universe, you by construction cannot be a subhalo, so it has to start at zero. And then it goes to something like 15%. And that's probably the number of people would have told you if you ask someone who does these kinds of simulations. But now if you look at these other definitions, that number drastically changes. So let's go smaller first, so 200 or 500 critical, you're down by a factor of two, basically, only half as many subhalos. If you use 200 mean, you're already quite a bit above. And then if you use the splashback radii, you're dramatically increasing your fraction of subhalos to so something more like 35% at the low mass end, another factor of two. And so what I'm saying is I would argue that our whole understanding of how many satellites and subhalos there are has just been tainted by these definitions that are not including enough subhalos. What's really weird to me is that this, is, this seemed like such a fundamental plot to me, but I'd never seen it in the literature. And so that's why I wanted to make it basically. Um, another thing is coming back to these ejected halos that we talked about in the beginning, these things that are orbiting outside of the radius of their host halo. So here I'm showing you a funny plot. Um, so this is for one host halo, which is on the left of the plot. So that vertical line you imagine is sort of the center of that host halo. And on the x-axis you have distance. So halos are coming in from the right as they're moving towards this big host halo. 
Uh, each trajectory is really a trajectory in space and time of the halo falling in. Uh, they are marked blue when there are subhalos, and they're marked purple when they're these backsplash halos, as they're called. So these uh, halos that are ejected halos that are uh, orbiting outside the radius of the host. And so, of course, in the first panel, as I'm using a very small host radius, R500 critical, we see a ton of these purple halos orbiting outside of that radius. If we increase that radius to R200 critical, it gets a bit better, but there's still quite a few, 200 mean, still quite a few. So the, the orbit, they're sort of mostly inside that radius, but then they peak out. Um, and again, this would be then very confusing, right? So if you just measure that in your simulation at fixed time, you will not realize that necessarily and call that an isolated halo. And now when we use the splashback radius, by construction, it includes all of these orbits. And so that's why I'm arguing that this is the definition that I think makes more physical sense, certainly for this particular case. And I'm arguing that basically this whole idea of ejected subhalos is sort of wrong, right? That there is no such thing. They are orbiting their halo. It's just a matter of defining the radius such that they're included. Good. Um, so you might say, why should I care? You know, this is. Uh, or very nice in theory, but I'm not defining halo. So one example is, I think, the local group. Imagine our Milky Way halo on the left and Andromeda on the right. So here the, the circles are showing virial radii, which I pulled from the recent literature, basically. Sort of, we don't know exactly, but we have pretty good guesses. So the picture is that our halos are close, but not touching. And then we have in blue the little satellites that we know of, so they are very biased towards the center because that's where we've been able to see them. And then in white we have some more local group dwarfs that we know of that are not satellites according to these halo radii. Now this picture would drastically change if we use splashback radii. There would be something like this. Now I don't know what they are yet because we don't know the mass accretion rates. We can only make a guess, right? We haven't measured this, but there will be something like this probably. And so that means that your whole picture changes, right? So our halos are actually touching, which means the orbital space is touching. So you could imagine, for example, satellites switching from the Milky Way to Andromeda and vice versa. The red points would become satellites. So things like LEO1, LEO2 would actually be satellites according to the splashback radius, which, you know, then explains why there is this whole literature about whether they are actually orbiting or not, or whether they're ejected subhalos. Anyway, um, I think this is just a neat example of, of why these things matter for our understanding. Um, and I'm also very hopeful that we will be able to measure these radii soonish because we're getting more and more of these little satellite galaxies. And with future surveys um, like WFIRST, these numbers will go up vastly and they will go out to these radii that we need to probe. So I think it will be really fun to get a dynamical measurement of the local group and see how far out galaxies are orbiting, which will then tell us how fast the Milky Way is actually growing, which is a number that's quite hard to get at otherwise, and we don't really have a good handle on it at all. So speaking of observations, what else can we do with all these amazing new instruments that are coming online? Uh, turns out a lot, basically. Any galaxy survey can be used for this. So one project that was just finished by a graduate student, Anya Chakai, she's a student of Alexi Leotose in Santa Cruz. Um, she was thinking about, what can we do with these surveys? How accurately can we measure a splashback? Could we, for example, now split the cluster sample and really measure this dependence on mass accretion rate? And the answer is yes. With something like LSST, we can absolutely distinguish where this feature, this steepening, will sit. However, there's a big caveat. So on the x-axis, where I have the mass accretion rate, um, we're just assuming that we can measure that somehow. And that's actually not easy. So that's, you know, so there, that, that is sort of an unsolved problem here that we still also need to solve. But it's very exciting. Um, another thing that we can then think about is doing fundamental physics with the splashback radius. Basically, what it promises to do is this realization that the, the profile of halos depends on their dynamics and uh, on their history really opens the door for many things. So here, for example, is a plot where we have, again, the slope profile for different uh, models of self-interacting dark matter. So self-interacting dark matter is when the dark matter is not totally collisionless, but they actually sort of interact a little bit, these particles. And this profile would actually change somewhat. I mean, so it's small changes, right? But with these future surveys, it's completely plausible that we'll get these profiles down to one, 
And so then we can start to really do fundamental physics. There are similar results about modified gravity now, which can also lead to small changes in these halo profiles. And so I'm really excited about basically turning these halos into laboratories for physics. One thing that I think is really needed on the theory side, though, is that we get away from the spherical cow. So everything I've shown you so far was radii, radii, radii. And if you look carefully at these pictures, you would see that a lot of these halos aren't really all that spherical. They're kind of ellipsoidal, but also not really. They have really weird shapes, shapes like this one. And so what I'm showing you here is an idea where what if we take the, not just the radii where these particles reach their first apocenter, but just their positions and then base a non-spherical halo surface on that. And this is something that was pioneered by Philip, uh, Philip Mansfield, uh, who is now a postdoc at Stanford. He actually wrote um, an entire algorithm to detect the splashback radius that I didn't have time to talk about today, uh, sort of was an alternative to Sparta, which does this uh, basically from looking at the three-dimensional density field. It's also a perfectly valid way of detecting the splashback radius. Uh, and so my student Spencer Scott was working or is working on um, on transferring this to the dynamical measurements. And so I think the splashback radius is a really interesting uh, opportunity for us to finally define surfaces for halos that are not just spheres. And the idea then, of course, would be to do that again for a whole universe and end up with a universe of these weirdly, oddly shaped halos and then figure out which halo is inside another halo uh, based on that, which again would make a very large difference, I think, in how we define and understand uh, dark matter structure. So what I want you to take away from this talk is that halo formation and dark matter dynamics are really not solved problems. These are sort of, they seem solved maybe at some point, but there really is, there are a ton of open questions about these. The splashback boundary is a physically motivated uh, and observable definition of the halo edge. Um, and I hope we get to use it in the future. And for that purpose, we now have these publicly available um, halo catalogs that are basically a conventional rock star halo catalog, but with this extra information. Um, and I hope I could convince you that changing these definitions can have a really drastic impact on what you will get out of these simulations. Thank you. <clears throat> Okay, thanks, thanks, Benedict. Uh, that was a fascinating talk. Um, if if anyone has questions, um, can you raise your hand, uh, clicking on the on the button? If you have a button, for um, okay, uh, maybe I, I will start uh, with a question. Well, I have I have at least a couple of questions, but um, so so this uh, Sparta code uh, it looks like a pretty you know, pretty uh, robust. Uh, uh, an algorithm for for tracking uh, particles, and it looks like it's almost almost like a halo finder. Can you? I, I mean, I know there are some halo finders that that try to. I think there's one called origami or something like that. They they try to define halos based on the on the on the on, on the orbits. Um, so have you considered, or or is it is it feasible to basically forget about rockstar, just use part of to to do everything to to find define the halos and everything, or? Or that, is that a crazy yeah, one? no, that's a great question. So um, origami, actually, you're right, what it does is it, it looks for flips in the positions of particles, right? So they would start, say, left, right in the initial density field. And then if they flip in all three dimensions, you say, oh, they're in a halo because, you know, they have been in multiple streams and so on, which is actually an idea that we considered in the beginning. We thought, is this maybe the same as flashback? But we came to the conclusion it's not quite the same. Anyway, um, so with Rockstar, yes. So the way I designed Sparta was, I was like, why should I rewrite a Halo Finder? Peter Beruzzi has already written this great tool. Uh, and so I used it based Sparta on it. In fact, actually, you can run Sparta on, on any Halo Finder. It doesn't matter. Um, but indeed, it's true that um, actually, so I think, what it, like, I think the algorithm that Peter uses to find Halo centers is very good. It's the six-dimensional phase space, friends of friends. It's basically the best you can do, I think. But what something like Sparta would be really useful for us, this idea of tracking the particles in time, right? That instead of going in at separate time slices and doing this halo finding over and over again, what you want to do is you want to find a halo seed and then just follow all the particles. And this is actually something that Sparta, I should say Sparta does many things now that I didn't talk about in this talk. So it's been extended quite a bit. And one of these things is indeed tracking subhalos. Um, 
basically while they're getting disrupted in larger host halos, which is very different, difficult for halo finders to do. And so Peter and I are actually talking about um, what it would take to build a combined Rockstar and Sparta sort of halo finder that would automatically give you splashback radii because it would know about all these particle trajectories. So yeah, I think that's absolutely something I would like to work on soon. Right, right. right. Um, any, any other questions? Um, so I actually have another question. Um, so uh, so me, a student and I, uh, we were looking at uh, uh, the, you know, so I noticed in, in, in your slide, uh, when, when we, you were showing all of the data sets that, that are produced and, and that are included in your catalogs, uh, you, you have the, the halo spin, right? Using the Bullock uh, definition, right? Yeah, I mean, basically, let me just go back to that slide very quick. Um, so basically, it just, it's a full Rockstar catalog. So it has everything that you would expect, axis ratio, spins, blah, 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 blah. I see, I see. And do you know, do you know if this uh, Bullock spin is measured within, within which radius, uh, which radius is used for the Bullock spin? Is, is I mean, probably very, uh, or 200M. Yeah. yeah, because the, the thing is, yeah. I, I was, uh, uh, with a student, we were looking at the histories of, of how this uh, Bullock spin parameter evolves with redshift. And it's so noisy. It's uh, it's uh, mm -hmm. it's really noisy for for the same halo. Even if no, no, I assume the merger trees are right, right? But but the halo spin is, is so so noisy. So I was thinking that maybe it's a question that we should not be using uh, the R two hundred uh, to to measure the halo spin, right? And and actually your uh, your plots clarify this. Uh, you have <laughs> you have uh, satellites going uh, in and out of, of this. Uh, uh, R200. That's a really good point. So I wonder how much that would contribute, right? If you have a big satellite sort of coming in and then boom, it suddenly like gives you a ton of spin and then it goes out again and yeah, that could totally happen. Yeah, I think uh, that's right. I think there are many quantities like that that we could define more carefully. And I know this always sounds a little like pedantic, right? You're like, oh, maybe we can define this a little better, but it's really important, right? Like if you have quantities that are sort of, that come out of your halo catalogs, out of your simulation, sort of not ideally defined, they will just lead to confusing science in the end. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, yeah. So it, it's, it's still amazing that we still find uh, some correlations with uh, the halo spin, even, even as, as unstable as, as the definition, as the Bullock definition yeah. seems, seems to be. Um, I see we have a, a question from Ed Edgar. Um, yes, I can speak or I write the question. Um, oh, whatever you I prefer, can you. Yeah, you can speak maybe. Thank you. Thank you for the conference, very interesting. I just want to ask some things that you have already shown here so I can get there more clearly. And the splashback radius is considering all these satellite particles that um, are going around the, the halo. So all these dynam dynamics when these particles are coming near and farther from the center of the halo are changing maybe the center of mass. And maybe it's just uh, so negligible, the, the masses of these satellites, but this center of mass is changing, it's not constant in time because the satellites are considering the splashback radius. So the, the center of mass changing over time changed, for example, the, the way in which halos interact with each other. Is this correct? Um, yeah, so actually you're right. And the, this is the reason why we do not use the center of mass typically. Because indeed this, like, this goes right back to Vicente's question as well. Like as you suspected, right, if you had satellites coming in, your center of mass would be very noisy quantity and so indeed what um, halo finders like rockstar use is the point of deepest potential so you know you go to you you sort of find the particle that is the most bound to the halo and uh, or like the the average of the few most bound particles and that turns out to be a much more stable definition than center of mass okay thank you and and i want to tell also that there's a question in the chat window thank you thank you Oh, I don't see another question in the chat. Um, I, I think I think we missed we missed maybe we missed a question from from in the middle of the talk. Or oh, I'm sorry. If it, I, in my chat there is no new question except the one that I answered in the middle of the talk. Or right, right, yeah. No, actually, actually, yeah. Same, same for me. Okay, good. 
So if, if your chat question got ignored, please repost it. Um, okay, uh, anymore? I, I already asked uh, uh, too many questions, but I, I, I could ask more. Um, so, uh, okay, I'll ask one more about uh, about uh, halo fitting. Um, so I, I see that uh, Colossus, uh, your Colossus has a fitting, like profile fitting. Um, Tools, right? So, uh, but actually, back in when I, back in back in grad school, I, I did not have a, I did not know about Colossus, so I I, I made I, I brought my own fitting uh, uh, procedure. But it's it's, uh, it's 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 a bit it's a bit uh, it's a slightly uh, different uh, methodology. So basically, for for an Inastor profile, for example, you could I guess the, the traditional approach is to to uh, to define beams in radius, right? Um, you measure the, uh, the the profile. You calculate the profile, um, and then you fit the profile, right? and you have uncertainties in each in each beam. Uh, uh. But another approach would be to to consider the like uh, like a probability function, like the a nastro. Uh, you could you could assume that the particles of a halo are drawn from a, like a sort of uh, a nastro uh, probability distribution function, and then do like a maximum likelihood. Uh, like you, you basically you maximize the probability of that the particles are are drawn from an inastro like uh, probability distribution, right? So, so that's that's what I was doing, and it, it might be it might be more expensive, but I think it was working well. So, I was wondering if uh, if this is something you have uh, right, right? Yeah. Um, it, it, uh, is it like a possible disadvantage of of doing this method, or or is it like? No, I mean, I think it fundamentally, this is a good way to go. Um, the problem is that I'm not sure you get around the fundamental profile, which is, in my mind, the following. So the profiles, they have this vast dynamic range, right? They go from 10 to the 6 or whatever in, in units of the mean density or even more at the center, depending on essentially how well resolved your simulation is, all the way out to what the mean density right, by construction. So you have a dynamical range of 10 to the 6 or so in these profiles that you're fitting. And so the weighting is critically important, right? Do you weight? So if you weight linear density, you're immediately toast because the only thing that will matter is the center. So you can't do that. Then you can do logarithmic density, okay? You know, it's also just a number. And you're still actually overweighting the center a lot, right? You will then, so uh, it's true you can, of course, use the, the, um, the uncertainty also, but in a simulation, that's actually often difficult because you don't have an uncertainty. Right? Your profile is perfectly certain. So here, what I'm showing with this power, by the way, is the scatter in this, um, this set of profiles, not the error. The error on that red line is zero. Right? It's just an average over simulated profiles. And so then the question becomes, what do you mean by best fit? And there's actually a student at MIT, um, Stephanie O'Neill, she's one of Mark Fogelsberger's students, who has been exploring this. And she's actually putting out a paper, it should be on the archive in a few weeks, um, where she ran into this issue and we looked at it in a bit more detail and I realized that some of the things I had been doing were also just choices, right? So I, I, I had just have chosen to do it in a particular way. So I think I weighted it by R squared, which then gives you a slightly more flat profile. So that's one way to do it. But why R squared? Why not R to the 2.3, right? I mean, so basically you're shifting whether you, you're weighting the inner or outer profile more. And as far as I know, nobody has really solved that fundamental question of how do you get around that? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm not sure your method of maximizing the probability gets around that because I think you still have to write down what probability means. But maybe there is a way to do it that doesn't rely on this sort of absolute value of the density. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. We, I, I can tell you more uh, later. Mm -hmm. I think it's not. No, very, I'm interested in this question. It's not very standard. Uh, I, but yeah. Oh. I have a question. If I can only ask like that. Sure. Yeah. So I was, uh, I think I missed it when you were talking about this result of the backsplash radius of um, self interacting dark matter. Mm -hmm. So, how that compares with a 
with a CDM? Oh yeah, so CDM, so in this plot that I'm showing, it's the slope, which I know can be a little misleading. So it's this D log row over D log R, right? So I should yeah. say that in reality, so the deviation from the actual density profile is small, right? Yeah. It's, you have to really look at the slope, sort of how's it curved and so on. Um, but so the black line is CDM in this case. Mm -hmm. and then okay. Blue and red are the ones that you should probably be looking at. So these are two different models for self-interacting dark, uh, dark matter that are, by the I way, Sorry, Sorry. I was going to ask what kind of, because uh, usually when I listen to self-interacting, I mean, it doesn't say too much because there's like many models. So I yeah. was wondering, what model is this one? I mean, right. so, um, yeah, so I didn't want to go into too many details during the talk. Um, yeah, Oka Banerjee and, and his collaborators um, know much more about this than I do, but my understanding is that basically, so there are fundamentally, uh, you can have an isotropic or an anisotropic cross section, right? Mm -hmm. So does it matter if two particles hit each other like sort of face on or 90 degrees or whatever? So in, if it's isotropic, it doesn't matter. I think that's sort of an easier model to work out. And then if it's anisotropic, then you get other effects. For example, if a subhalo is flying through a big host halo and it's anisotropic, then you would have preferred scattering in that direction something like that. So because, sorry. just to finish this really quickly, so the red line is an anisotropic model and the blue line is an isotropic model. Yeah. And they are, the cross section is one centimeter square per gram. That is actually pretty conservative. So that's by no means excluded. The green line is, I think, sort of kind of at the edge of being excluded already by other constraints. Because I was wondering, I work with uh, the scalar field dark matter. And you can also include a self interaction. But if you only have, like, is this fuzzy dark matter? So basically, you just have to fix uh, or something that gives you, I mean, the, the size of the halo or the slope of the halo can give you an idea of the mass of the particle. So I was wondering in this case, if you have the splashback um, radius, if that could give you in this scalar field dark matter model, in this fuzzy dark matter model, how could it be related to the mass of the boson? So I, I thought it was kind of interesting when you mentioned the self-interacting dark matter. Yeah, I, uh, I don't know because nobody has done this yet. And I would love, like if you ever have density profiles lying around of halos in your fuzzy dark matter, I would love uh, uh, for you to figure it out or, or to see them, you know? Um, so basically this is just like nobody has looked yet as far as I know. Yeah, okay, um, let's do it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank if you me. have density profiles, it should not be difficult. Yeah. Right? You just plug yeah, this, it, you know, how does it look different from cold dark matter basically? Yeah, yeah, great. Yeah, I would write um, to you for sure. So I've been talking to Philip Mox, who was sort of, you know, a colleague of Descenders and, and mine at Harvard, and you might know of him. He's at Princeton now, and he's, he's yeah. running a lot of these uh, fuzzy dark matter simulations as well. Yeah. So from his paper, I think there was one where it showed profiles, and it, it, it looked to me like they looked quite different from cold dark matter halos, sort of in the outskirts. But then I also wasn't sure if they were maybe isolated simulations rather than cosmological, and so then it sort of... I don't know if I think they are mostly isolated and I you, I usually work with dwarf galaxies so we so the thing with the the fuzzy dark matter is that you can make a core for these uh, small galaxies and also when you're studying like bigger galaxies like you said you uh you can uh, recover CDM at large scale so yeah but the thing that was very interesting to us is that when you study this model and you put I don't know, we were doing uh, just dynamics of uh, dwarf galaxies. But if you study this kind of model, we ended up with the same um, range on the mass of the boson. So mm. that was quite interesting. I was trying with, uh, with my colleagues to, I mean, to break the model, but we, we can't. So um, I think it's interesting just to, to put out like another test to this model, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yep, no, thank I think you. That'd be, that'd be really interesting. And you know, who knows? Maybe, yeah. maybe this is the way to break it, right? Because as you saw, we already <laughs> have pretty good observations on splashback now, right? So, exactly. I mean, I wouldn't be as optimistic as to say, does this already exclude certain boson masses, for example? But one should probably check at this point. I, I, I think it can be done. Let's, let's yeah. see. Thank Sounds you. Good. Well, if you ever have anything, feel free to email me. I, I'd love to hear about it. 
Sure, yeah, thank you. <clears throat> okay. Um, so if there are no, no more questions, I think we should uh, thank Benedict again. And uh, I hope you can visit in person uh, some, some, someday. <laughs> um, I would love that. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and students, don't, don't use Colossus for your, for your uh, course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's forbidden. No yeah. Colossus in class. Well, thank you all so much for having me. Um, this was the longest I have not looked at election results since Tuesday night. So this was actually a very nice hour for my mind. <laughs> and yeah, goodbye. Yeah, good, good luck with that uh, as well. Yeah, uh, good luck to everybody here, I guess. Okay. Thanks. Bye.